Chapter 15 of The History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Johns, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 15 The Story of Hujaku. 1211. China. The Chinese Wall. The accounts given us of the events and transaction of Genghis Khan's reign after he acquired the supreme power over the Mongol and Tartar nations are imperfect, and in many respects confused. It appears, however, from them that in the year 1211, that is about five years after his election as Grand Khan, he became involved in a war with the Chinese, which led in the end to very important consequences. The kingdom of China lay to the southward of the Mongol territories, and the frontier was defended by the famous Chinese Wall, which extended from east to west, over hills and valleys, from the great desert to the sea, for many hundred miles. The wall was defended by towers, built here and there, in commanding positions along the whole extent of it, and at certain distances there were fortified towns where powerful garrisons were stationed, and reserves of troops were held ready to be marched to different points along the wall wherever there might be occasion for their services. The Frontier The wall was not strictly the Chinese frontier, for the territory on the outside of it, to a considerable distance, was held by the Chinese government, and there were many large towns and some very strong fortresses in this outlying region, all of which were held and garrisoned by Chinese troops. Outside the Wall The inhabitants, however, of the countries outside the Wall were generally of the Tartar or Mongol race. They were of a nation or tribe called the Kitten, and were somewhat inclined to rebel against the Chinese rule. In order to assist in keeping them in subjection, one of the Chinese emperors issued a decree which ordained that the governors of those provinces should place in all the large towns and other strongholds outside the wall twice as many families of the Chinese as there were of the kitten. This regulation greatly increased the discontent of the kitten and made them more inclined to rebellion than they were before. Origin of the Quarrel with the Chinese Yang Si Besides this, there had been for some time a growing difficulty between the Chinese government and Genghis Khan. It seems that the Mongols had been for a long time accustomed to pay some sort of tribute to the emperor of China, and many years before, while Genghis Khan, under the name of Temujin, was living at Karakoram, a subject of Vang Khan, the emperor sent a certain royal prince named Yang Si to receive what was due. While Yang Si was in the Mongol territory, he and Temujin met, but they did not agree together at all. The Chinese prince put some slight upon Temujin, which Temujin resented. Very likely Temujin, whose character at that time, as well as afterward, was marked with a great deal of pride and spirit, opposed the payment of the tribute. At any rate, Yang Si became very much incensed against him, and on his return made serious charges against him to the emperor, and urged that he should be seized and put to death. But the emperor declined engaging in so dangerous an undertaking. Yang Si's proposal, however, became known to Temujin, and he secretly resolved that he would one day have his revenge. At length, about three or four years after Temujin, was raised to the throne, the emperor of the Chinese died, and Yang Si succeeded him. The very next year, he sent an officer to Genghis Khan to demand the usual tribute. When the officer came into the presence of Genghis Khan in his camp and made his demand, Genghis Khan asked him who was the emperor that had sent him with such a message. The officer replied that Yang Si was at that time emperor of the Chinese. Genghis Khan's contempt for him. Yang Si, repeated Genghis Khan in a tone of great contempt. The Chinese have a proverb, he added, 
that such a people as they ought to have a god for their emperor but it seems they do not know how to choose even a decent man it was true that they had such a proverb they were as remarkable it seems in those days as they are now for their national self-importance and vanity go and tell your emperor added genghis khan that i am a sovereign ruler and that i will never acknowledge him as my master armies raised hujaku when the messenger returned with this defiant answer yang si was very much enraged and immediately began to prepare for war genghis khan also at once commenced his preparations he sent envoys to the leading khans who occupied the territories outside the wall inviting them to join him he raised a great army and put the several divisions of it under the charge of his ablest generals yang si raised a great army too the historians say that it amounted to three hundred thousand men he put this army under the command of a great general named hujaku and ordered him to advance with it to the northward so as to intercept the army of genghis khan on its way and to defend the wall and the fortresses on the outside of it from his attacks many of the khans come over on genghis's side in the campaign which ensued genghis khan was most successful the mongols took possession of a great many towns and fortresses beyond the wall and every victory that they gained made the tribes and nations that inhabited those provinces more and more disposed to join them many of them revolted against the chinese authority and turned to their side one of these was a chieftain so powerful that he commanded an army of one hundred thousand men in order to bind himself solemnly to the covenant which he was to make with genghis khan he ascended a mountain in company with the envoy and with others who were to witness the proceedings and there performed the ceremony customary on such occasions the ceremony consisted of sacrificing a white horse and a black ox and then breaking an arrow at the same time pronouncing an oath by which he bound himself under the most solemn sanctions to be faithful to genghis khan to reward the prince for this act of adhesion to his cause genghis khan made him king over all that portion of the country and caused him to be everywhere so proclaimed this encouraged a great many other khans and chieftains to come over to his side and at length one who had the command of one of the gates of the great wall and of the fortress which defended it joined him by this means genghis khan obtained access to the interior of the chinese dominions and yang si and his great general hujaku became seriously alarmed victory over hujaku at length after various marchings and countermarchings genghis khan learned that hujaku was encamped with the whole of his army in a very strong position at the foot of a mountain and he determined to proceed thither and attack him he did so and the result of the battle was that hujaku was beaten and was forced to retreat he retired to a great fortified town and genghis khan followed him and laid siege to the town hujaku finding himself in imminent danger fled and genghis khan was on the point of taking the town when he was suddenly stopped in his career by being one day wounded severely by an arrow which was shot at him from the wall genghis khan is wounded the wound was so severe that while suffering under it genghis khan found that he could not successfully direct the operations of the army and so he withdrew his troops and retired into his own country to wait there until his wound should be healed in a few months he was entirely recovered and the next year he fitted out a new expedition and advanced again into china hujaku disgraced in the meantime hujaku who had been repeatedly defeated and driven back the year before by genghis khan had fallen into disgrace his rivals and enemies among the other generals of the army and among the officers of the court conspired against him and represented to the emperor that he was unfit to command and that his having failed to defend the towns and the country 
that had been committed to him was owing to his cowardice and incapacity in consequence of these representations hujaku was cashiered that is dismissed from his command in disgrace restored again this made him very angry and he determined that he would have his revenge there was a large party in his favor at court as well as a party against him and after a long and bitter contention the former once more prevailed and induced the emperor to restore hujaku to his command again dissensions among the chinese the quarrel however was not ended and so when genghis khan came the next year to renew the invasion the councils of the chinese were so distracted and their operations so paralyzed by this feud that he gained very easy victories over them the chinese generals instead of acting together in a harmonious manner against the common enemy were intent only on the quarrel which they were waging against each other at length the animosity proceeded to such an extreme that hujaku resolved to depose the emperor who seemed inclined rather to take part against him assassinate all the chiefs of the opposite party and then finally to put the emperor to death and cause himself to be proclaimed in his stead advance of the mongols in order to prepare the way for the execution of this scheme he forbore to act vigorously against genghis khan and the mongols but allowed them to advance farther and farther into the country this of course increased the general discontent and excitement and prepared the way for the revolt which hujaku was plotting hujaku's rebellion death of yang si at length the time for action arrived hujaku suddenly appeared at the head of a large force at the gates of the capital and gave the alarm that the mongols were coming he pressed forward into the city to the palace and gave the alarm there at the same time files of soldiers whom he had ordered to this service went to all parts of the city arresting and putting to death all the leaders of the party opposed to him under pretense that he had discovered a plot or conspiracy in which they were engaged to betray the city to the enemy the excitement and confusion which was produced by this charge and by the alarm occasioned by the supposed coming of the mongols so paralyzed the authorities of the town that nobody resisted hujaku or attempted to save the persons whom he arrested some of them he caused to be killed on the spot others he shut up in prison finding himself thus undisputed master of the city he next took possession of the palace seized the emperor deposed him from his office and shut him up in a dungeon soon afterward he put him to death this was the end of yang si but hujaku did not succeed after all in his design of causing himself to be proclaimed emperor in his stead he found that there would be very great opposition to this and so he gave up this part of his plan and finally raised a certain prince of the royal family to the throne while he retained his office of commander-in-chief of the forces having thus as he thought effectually destroyed the influence and power of his enemies at the capital he put himself once more at the head of his troops and went forth to meet genghis khan hujaku advances some accident happened to him about this time by which his foot was hurt so that he was in some degree disabled but still he went on at length he met the vanguard of genghis khan's army at a place where they were attempting to cross a river by a bridge hujaku determined immediately to attack them the state of his foot was such that he could not walk or even mount a horse but he caused himself to be put upon a sort of car and was by this means carried into the battle the battle hujaku's victory the mongols were completely defeated and driven back perhaps this was because genghis khan was not there to command them he was at some distance in the rear with the main body of the army hujaku was very desirous of following up his victory by pursuing and attacking the mongol vanguard the next day he could not however do this personally 
for on account of the excitement and exposure which he had endured in the battle and the rough movements and joltings which notwithstanding all his care he had to bear in being conveyed to and fro about the field his foot grew much worse inflammation set in during the night and the next day the wound opened afresh so he was obliged to give up the idea of going out himself against the enemy and to send one of his generals instead the general to whom he gave the command was named khan ki khan ki's expedition failure hujaku enraged khan ki went out against the enemy but after a time returned unsuccessful hujaku was very angry with him when he came to hear his report perhaps the wound in his foot made him impatient and unreasonable at any rate he declared that the cause of khan ki's failure was his dilatoriness in pursuing the enemy which was cowardice or treachery and in either case he deserved to suffer death for it he immediately sent to the emperor a report of the case asking that the sentence of death which he had pronounced against khan ki might be confirmed and that he might be authorized to put it into execution but the emperor knowing that khan ki was a courageous and faithful officer would not consent in the meanwhile before the emperor's answer came back the wrath of hujaku had had time to cool a little accordingly when he received the answer he said to khan ki that he would after all try him once more take the command of the troops again said he and go out against the enemy if you beat them i will overlook your first offence and spare your life but if you are beaten yourself a second time you shall die khan ki's second trial the sandstorm so khan ki placed himself at the head of his detachment and went out again to attack the mongols they were to the northward and were posted it seems upon or near a sandy plain at any rate a strong north wind began to blow at the time when the attack commenced and blew the sand and dust into the eyes of his soldiers so that they could not see while their enemies the mongols having their backs to the wind were very little incommoded the result was that khan ki was repulsed with considerable loss and was obliged to make the best of his way back to hujaku's quarters to save the remainder of his men khan ki's desperate resolution he now was desperate hujaku had declared that if he came back without having gained a victory he should die and he had no doubt that the man was violent and reckless enough to keep his word he determined not to submit he might as well die fighting he thought at the head of his troops as to be ignobly put to death by hujaku's executioner so he arranged it with his troops who probably hated hujaku as much as he did that on returning to the town they should march in under arms take possession of the place surround the palace and seize the general and make him prisoner or kill him if he should attempt any resistance the attack hujaku's flight he is killed in the gardens the troops accordingly when they arrived at the gates of the town seized and disarmed the guards and then marched in brandishing their weapons and uttering loud shouts and outcries which excited first a feeling of astonishment and then of terror among the inhabitants the alarm soon spread to the palace indeed the troops themselves soon reached and surrounded the palace and began thundering at the gates to gain admission they soon forced their way in hujaku in the meantime terrified and panic-stricken had fled from the palace into the gardens in hopes to make his escape by the garden walls the soldiers pursued him in his excitement and agitation he leaped down from a wall too high for such a descent and in the fall broke his leg he lay writhing helplessly on the ground when the soldiers came up they were wild and furious with the excitement of pursuit and they killed him with their spears where he lay khan ki took the head of his old enemy and carried it to the capital with the intention of offering it to the emperor and also of surrendering himself to the officers of justice in order as he said that he might be put to death 
for the crime of which he had been guilty in heading a military revolt and killing his superior officer by all the laws of war this was a most heinous and a wholly unpardonable offence khan ki is pardoned and promoted but the emperor was heartily glad that the turbulent and unmanageable old general was put out of the way for a man so unprincipled so ambitious and so reckless as hujaku was is always an object of aversion and terror to all who have anything to do with him the emperor accordingly issued a proclamation in which he declared that hujaku had been justly put to death in punishment for many crimes which he had committed and soon afterward he appointed khan ki commander-in-chief of the forces in his stead end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter sixteen conquests in china twelve eleven to twelve sixteen war continued rich and fertile country grand invasion simultaneous attack by four armies after the death of hujaku the emperor of china endeavored to defend his dominions against genghis khan by means of his other generals and the war was continued for several years during which time genghis khan made himself master of all the northern part of china and ravaged the whole country in the most reckless and cruel manner the country was very populous and very rich the people unlike the mongols and tartars lived by tilling the ground and they practised in great perfection many manufacturing and mechanic arts the country was very fertile and in the place of the boundless pasturages of the mongol territories it was covered in all directions with cultivated fields gardens orchards and mulberry groves while thriving villages and busy towns were scattered over the whole face of it it was to protect this busy hive of wealth and industry that the great wall had been built ages before for the chinese had always been stationary industrious and peaceful while the territories of central asia lying to the north of them had been filled from time immemorial with wild roaming and unscrupulous troops of marauders like those who were now united under the banner of genghis khan the wall had afforded for some hundreds of years an adequate protection for no commander had appeared of sufficient power to organize and combine the various hordes on a scale great enough to enable them to force so strong a barrier but now that genghis khan had come upon the stage the barrier was broken through and the terrible and reckless hordes poured in with all the force and fury of an inundation in the year twelve fourteen which was the year following that in which hujaku was killed genghis khan organized a force so large for the invasion of china that he divided it into four different battalions which were to enter by different roads and ravage different portions of the country each of these divisions was by itself a great and powerful army and the simultaneous invasion of four such masses of reckless and merciless enemies filled the whole land with terror and dismay enthusiasm of the troops the chinese emperor sent the best bodies of troops under his command to guard the passes in the mountains and the bridges and fording places on the rivers hoping in this way to do something towards stemming the tide of these torrents of invasion but it was all in vain genghis khan had raised and equipped his forces by means in a great measure of the plunder which he had obtained in china the year before and he had made great promises and glowing representations to his men in respect to the booty to be obtained in this new campaign the troops were consequently full of ardor and enthusiasm and they pressed on with such impetuosity as to carry all before them captives 
immense plunder the emperor of china in pursuing his measures of defence had ordered all the men capable of bearing arms in the villages and in the open country to repair to the nearest large city or fortress there to be enrolled and equipped for service the consequence was that the mongols found in many places as they advanced through the country nobody but infirm old men and women and children in the hamlets and villages a great many of these especially such as seemed to be of most consequence the handsomest and best of the women and the oldest children they seized and took with them in continuing their march intending to make slaves of them and also of all the silks and other rich and valuable merchandise which they found and distributed it as plunder the spoil which they obtained too in sheep and cattle was enormous from it they made up immense flocks and herds which were driven off into the mongol country the rest were slaughtered and used to supply the army with food dreadful ravages it was the custom of the invaders after having pillaged a town and its environs and taken away all which they could convert to any useful purpose for themselves to burn the town itself and then to march on leaving in the place only a smoking heap of ruins with the miserable remnant of the population which they had spared wandering about the scene of desolation in misery and despair base use made of the captives they made a most cowardly and atrocious use too of the prisoners whom they conveyed away when they arrived at a fortified town where there was a garrison or any other armed force prepared to resist them they would bring forward these helpless captives and put them in the forefront of the battle in such a manner that the men on the walls could not shoot their arrows at their savage assailants without killing their own wives and children the officers commanded the men to fire notwithstanding but they were so moved by the piteous cries which the women and children made that they could not bear to do it and so they refused to obey and in the excitement and confusion thus produced the mongols easily obtained possession of the town extent of mongol conquests there are two great rivers in china both of which flow from west to east and they are at such a distance from each other and from the frontiers that they divide the territory into three nearly equal parts the northernmost of these rivers is the wang ho the mongols in the course of two years overran and made themselves masters of almost the whole country lying north of this river that is of about one-third of china proper there were however some strongly fortified towns which they found it very difficult to conquer the siege of yen king among other places there was the imperial city of yen king where the emperor himself resided which was so strongly defended that for some time the mongols did not venture to attack it at length however genghis khan came himself to the place and concentrated there a very large force the emperor and his court were very much alarmed expecting an immediate assault still genghis khan hesitated some of his generals urged him to scale the walls and so force his way into the city but he thought it more politic to adopt a different plan proposed terms of arrangement so he sent an officer into the town with proposals of peace to be communicated to the emperor in these proposals genghis khan said that he himself was inclined to spare the town but that to appease his soldiers who were furious to attack and pillage the city it would be necessary to make them considerable presents and that if the emperor would agree to such terms with him as should enable him to satisfy his men in this respect he would spare the city and would retire difference of opinion the emperor and his advisers were much perplexed at the receipt of this proposal there was great difference of opinion among the counsellors in respect to the reply which was to be made to it some were in favor of rejecting it at once one general not content with a simple rejection of it proposed that to show the indignation and resentment which they felt in receiving it the garrison should march out of the gates and attack the mongols in their camp 
consultation on the subject. There were other ministers, however, who urged the emperor to submit to the necessity of the case and make peace with the conqueror. They said that the idea of going out to attack the enemy in their camp was too desperate to be entertained for a moment, and if they waited within the walls and attempted to defend themselves there, they exposed themselves to a terrible danger without any countervailing hope of advantage at all commensurate with it. For if they failed to save the city, they were all utterly and irretrievably ruined, and if, on the other hand, they succeeded in repelling the assault, it was only a brief respite that they could hope to gain, for the Mongols would soon return in greater numbers and in a higher state of excitement and fury than ever. Besides, they said, the garrison was discontented and depressed in spirit, and would make but a feeble resistance. It was composed, mainly, of troops brought in from the country, away from their families and homes, and all that they desired was to be released from duty, in order that they might go and see what had become of their wives and children. The conditions accepted, terms of peace agreed upon. The emperor, in the end, adopted this counsel, and he sent a commissioner to the camp of Genghis Khan to ask on what terms peace could be made. Genghis Khan stated the conditions. They were very hard, but the emperor was compelled to submit to them. One of the stipulations was that Genghis Khan was to receive one of the Chinese princesses, a daughter of the late emperor Yang Si, to add to the number of his wives. There were also to be delivered to him, for slaves, five hundred young boys and as many girls, three thousand horses, a large quantity of silk, and an immense sum of money. As soon as these conditions were fulfilled, after dividing the slaves and the booty among the officers and soldiers of his army, Genghis Khan raised the siege and moved off to the northward. In respect to the captives that his soldiers had taken in the towns and villages, the women and children spoken of above, the army carried off with them all that were old enough to be of any value as slaves, the little children who would only, they thought, be in the way, they massacred. The Emperor's Uneasiness Consultations The Emperor was by no means easy after the Mongol army had gone. A marauding enemy like that, bought off by the payment of a ransom, is exceedingly apt to find some pretext for returning, and the Emperor did not feel that he was safe. Very soon after the Mongols had withdrawn, he proposed to his council the plan of removing his court southward to the other side of the Wang Ho, to a large city in the province of Henan. Some of his counselors made great objections to this proposal. They said that if the emperor withdrew in that manner from the northern provinces, that portion of his empire would be irretrievably lost. Genghis Khan would soon obtain complete and undisputed possession of the whole of it, the proper course to be adopted, they said, was to remain and make a firm stand in defense of the capital and of the country. They must levy new troops, repair the fortifications, recruit the garrison, and lay in supplies of food and other military stores, and thus prepare themselves for a vigorous and efficient resistance in case the enemy should return. But the emperor could not be persuaded. He said that the treasury was exhausted, the troops were discouraged, the cities around the capital were destroyed, and the whole country was so depopulated by the devastations of the Mongols that no considerable number of fresh levies could be obtained, and that, consequently, the only safe course for the government to pursue was to retire to the southward, beyond the river. He would, however, he added, leave his son with a strong garrison to defend the capital." abandonment of the capital, revolt of the guards. He accordingly took with him a few favorites of his immediate family and a small body of troops, and commenced his journey, a journey which was considered by all the people as a base and ignoble flight. He involved himself in endless troubles by this step. A revolt broke out on the way among the guards who accompanied him. One of the generals who headed the revolt sent a messenger to Genghis Khan, informing him of the emperor's abandonment of his capital, 
and offering to go over with all the troops under his command to the service of genghis khan if genghis khan would receive him the siege of the capital renewed when genghis khan heard thus of the retreat of the emperor from his capital he was or pretended to be much incensed he considered the proceeding as in some sense an act of hostility against himself and as such an infraction of the treaty and a renewal of the war so he immediately ordered one of his leading generals a certain chieftain named mingan to proceed southward at the head of a large army and lay siege to yang king again the old emperor who seems now to have lost all spirit and to have given himself up entirely to despondency and fear was greatly alarmed for the safety of his son the prince whom he had left in command at yen king he immediately sent orders to his son to leave the city and come to him the departure of the prince in obedience to these orders of course threw an additional gloom over the city and excited still more the general discontent which the emperor's conduct had awakened wan yen and man yen their perplexity the prince on his departure left two generals in command of the garrison their names were wan yen and man yen they were left to defend the city as well as they could from the army of mongols under mingan which was now rapidly drawing near the generals were greatly embarrassed and perplexed with the difficulties of their situation the means of defense at their disposal were wholly inadequate and they knew not what to do suicide proposed at length one of them wan yen proposed to the other that they should kill themselves this man yen refused to do man yen was the commander on whom the troops chiefly relied and he considered suicide a mode of deserting one's post scarcely less dishonorable than any other he said that his duty was to stand by his troops and if he could not defend them where they were to endeavor to draw them away while there was an opportunity to a place of safety wan yen in despair so wan yen finding his proposal rejected went away in a rage he retired to his apartment and wrote a dispatch to the emperor in which he explained the desperate condition of affairs and the impossibility of saving the city and in the end declared himself deserving of death for not being able to accomplish the work which his majesty had assigned to him he enveloped and sealed this dispatch and then calling his domestics together he divided among them in a very calm and composed manner all his personal effects and then took leave of them and dismissed them his suicide a single officer only now remained with him in the presence of this officer he wrote a few words and then sent him away as soon as the officer had gone he drank a cup of poison which he had previously ordered to be prepared for him and in a few minutes was a lifeless corpse man yen's plan petition of the wives in the meantime the other general man yen had been making preparations to leave the city his plan was to take with him such troops as might be serviceable to the emperor but to leave all the inmates of the palace as well as the inhabitants of the city to their fate among the people of the palace were it seems a number of the emperor's wives whom he had left behind at the time of his own flight he having taken with him at that time only a few of the more favored ones these women who were left when they heard that man yen was intending to abandon the city with a view of joining the emperor in the south came to him in a body and begged him to take them with him sacking of the city by mingan in order to relieve himself of their solicitations he said that he would do so but he added that he must leave the city himself with the guards to prepare the way and that he would return immediately for them they were satisfied with this promise and returned to the palace to prepare for the journey man yen at once left the city and very soon after he had gone mingan the mongol general arrived at the gates and meeting with no effectual resistance he easily forced his way in and a scene of universal terror and confusion ensued 
the soldiers spread themselves over the city in search of plunder and killed all who came in their way they plundered the palace and then set it on fire so extensive was the edifice and so vast were the stores of clothing and other valuables which it contained even after all the treasures which could be made available to the conquerors had been taken away that the fire continued to burn among the ruins for a month or more massacres what became of the unhappy women who were so cruelly deceived by mon Yen in respect to their hopes of escape does not directly appear they doubtless perished with the other inhabitants of the city in the general massacre soldiers at such a time while engaged in the sack and plunder of a city are always excited to a species of insane fury and take a savage delight in thrusting their pikes into all that come in their way fate of mon Yen. mon Yen excused himself when he arrived at the quarters of the emperor for having thus abandoned the women to their fate by the alleged impossibility of saving them he could not have succeeded he said in effecting his own retreat and that of the troops who went with him if he had been encumbered in his movements by such a company of women the emperor accepted this excuse and seemed to be satisfied with it though not long afterward mon Yen was accused of conspiracy against the emperor and was put to death treasures mingan took possession of the imperial treasury where he found great stores of silk and also of gold and silver plate all these things he sent to genghis khan who remained still at the north at a grand encampment which he had made in tartary conquests extended governors appointed after this other campaigns were fought by genghis khan in china in the course of which he extended his conquests still farther to the southward and made himself master of a very great extent of country after confirming these conquests he selected from among such chinese officers as were disposed to enter into his service suitable persons to be appointed governors of the provinces and in this way annexed them to his dominions these officers thus transferring their allegiance from the emperor to him and covenanting to send to him the tribute which they should annually collect from their respective dominions everything being thus settled in this quarter genghis khan next turned his attention to the western frontiers of his empire where the tartar and mongol territory bordered on turkestan and the dominions of the mohammedans End of chapter 16chapter 17 of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter 17 the sultan mohammed 1217 the portion of china which genghis khan had added to his dominions by the conquest described in the last chapter was called katay and the possession of it added to the extensive territories which were previously under his sway made his empire very vast the country which he now held either under his direct government or as tributary provinces and kingdoms extended north and south through the whole interior of asia and from the shores of the japan and china seas on the east nearly to the caspian sea on the west a distance of nearly three thousand miles beyond his western limits lay turkestan and other countries governed by the mohammedans among the other mohammedan princes there was a certain sultan mohammed a great and very powerful sovereign who reigned over an extensive region in the neighborhood of the caspian sea though the principal seat of his power was a country called karazm he was in consequence sometimes styled mohammed karazm it might perhaps have been expected that genghis khan having subdued all the rivals within his reach in the eastern part of asia and being strong and secure in the possession of his power 
would have found some pretext for making war upon the sultan with a view of conquering his territories too and adding the countries bordering on the caspian to his dominions but for some reason or other he concluded in this instance to adopt a different policy whether it was that he was tired of war and wished for repose or whether the sultan's dominions were too remote or his power too great to make it prudent to attack him he determined on sending an embassy instead of an army with a view of proposing to the sultan a treaty of friendship and alliance the time when this embassy was sent was in the year twelve seventeen and the name of the principal ambassador was Mackinut. Mackinut set out on his mission accompanied by a large retinue of attendants and guards the journey occupied several weeks but at length he arrived in the sultan's dominions soon after his arrival he was admitted to an audience of the sultan and there accompanied by his own secretaries and in the presence of all the chief officers of the sultan's court he delivered his message he gave an account in his speech of the recent victories which his sovereign genghis khan had won and of the great extension which his empire had in consequence attained he was now become master he said of all the countries of central asia from the eastern extremity of the continent up to the frontiers of the sultan's dominions and having thus become the sultan's neighbor he was desirous of entering into a treaty of amity and alliance with him which would be obviously for the mutual interest of both he had accordingly been sent an ambassador to the sultan's court to propose such an alliance in offering it the emperor he said was actuated by a feeling of the sincerest good will he wished the sultan to consider him as a father and he would look upon the sultan as a son according to the patriarchal ideas of government which prevailed in those days the relation of father to son involved not merely the idea of a tie of affection connecting an older with a younger person but it implied something of pre-eminence and authority on the one part and dependence and subjection on the other perhaps genghis khan did not mean his proposition to be understood in this sense but made it solely in reference to the disparity between his own and the sultan's years for he was himself now becoming considerably advanced in life however this may be the sultan was at first not at all pleased with the proposition in the form in which the ambassador made it he however listened quietly to Mackinet's words and said nothing until the public audience was ended he then took Mackinet alone into another apartment in order to have some quiet conversation with him he first asked him to tell him the exact state of the case in respect to all the pretended victories which genghis khan had gained and in order to propitiate him and induce him to reveal the honest truth he made him a present of a rich scarf splendidly adorned with jewels how is it said he has the emperor really made all those conquests and is his empire as extensive and powerful as he pretends tell me the honest truth about it what i have told your majesty is the honest truth about it replied Mackinet. my master the emperor is as powerful as i have represented him and this your majesty will soon find out in case you come to have any difficulty with him this bold and defiant language on the part of the ambassador greatly increased the irritation which the sultan felt before he seemed much incensed and replied in a very angry manner i know not what your master means said he by sending such messages to me telling me of the provinces that he has conquered and boasting of his power or upon what ground he pretends to be greater than i and expects that i shall honor him as my father and be content to be treated by him only as his son is he so very great a personage as this 
Mackinet now found that perhaps he had spoken a little too plainly, and he began immediately to soften and modify what he had said, and to compliment the sultan himself, who, as he was well aware, was really superior in power and glory to Genghis Khan, notwithstanding the great extension to which the empire of the latter had recently attained. He also begged that the sultan would not be angry with him for delivering the message with which he had been entrusted. He was only a servant, he said, and he was bound to obey the orders of his master. He assured the sultan, moreover, that if any unfavorable construction could by possibility be put upon the language which the emperor had used, no such meaning was designed on his part, but that in sending the embassage, and in everything connected with it, the emperor had acted with the most friendly and honorable intentions. By means of conciliating language like this, the sultan was at length appeased, and he finally was induced to agree to everything which the ambassador proposed. A treaty of peace and commerce was drawn up and signed, and after everything was concluded, Mackinet returned to the Mongol country, loaded with presents, some of which were for himself and his attendants, and others were for Genghis Khan. He was accompanied, too, by a caravan of merchants, who, in consequence of the new treaty, were going into the country of Genghis Khan with their goods, to see what they could do in the new market thus opened to them. This caravan traveled in company with Mackinet on his return, in order to avail themselves of the protection which the guard that attended him could afford in passing through the intervening countries. These countries being filled with hordes of Tartars, who were very little under the dominion of law, it would have been unsafe for a caravan of rich merchandise to pass through them without an escort. Genghis Khan was greatly pleased with the result of his embassy. He was also much gratified with the presents that the sultan had sent him, which consisted of costly stuffs for garments, beautiful and highly wrought arms, precious stones, and other similar articles. He welcomed the merchants, too, and opened facilities for them to travel freely throughout his dominions and dispose of their goods. In order that future caravans might go and come at all times in safety, he established guards along the roads between his country and that of the sultan. These guards occupied fortresses built at convenient places along the way, and especially at the crossing places on the rivers and in the passes of the mountains, and their orders were given to these guards to scour the country in every direction around their respective posts in order to keep it clear of robbers. Whenever a band of robbers was formed, the soldiers hunted them from one lurking place to another until they were exterminated. In this way, after a short time, the country became perfectly safe, and the caravans of merchants could go and come with the richest goods, and even with treasures of gold and silver, without any fear. At first, it would seem, some of the merchants from the countries of Mohammed asked too much for their goods. At least a story is told of a company who came very soon after the opening of the treaty, and who offered their goods first to Genghis Khan himself, but they asked such high prices for them that he was astonished. I suppose, said he, by your asking such prices as these, you imagine that I have never bought any goods before. He then took them to see his treasures, and showed them over a thousand large chests, filled with valuables of every description, gold and silver utensils, rich silks, arms and accoutrements, specially adorned with precious stones and other such commodities. He told them that he showed them these things in order that they might see that he had had some experience in respect to dealings in merchandise of that sort before, and knew something of its just value, and that since they had been so exorbitant in their demands, presuming probably upon the ignorance of those whom they came to deal with, he should send them back with all their goods, and not allow them to sell them anywhere in his dominions at any price. This threat he put in execution. The merchants were obliged to go back without selling any of their goods at all. 
the next company of merchants that came having heard of the adventure of the others determined to act on a different principle accordingly when they came into the presence of the khan with their goods and he asked them the prices of some of them they replied that his majesty might himself fix the price of the articles as he was a far better judge of the value of such things than they were indeed they added that if his majesty chose to take them without paying anything at all he was welcome to do so this answer pleased the emperor very much he paid them double price for the articles which he selected from their stores and he granted them peculiar privileges in respect to trading with his subjects while they remained in his dominions the trade which was thus opened between the dominions of the sultan and those of genghis khan was not however wholly in the hands of merchants coming from the former country soon after the coming of the caravan last mentioned genghis khan fitted out a company of merchants from his own country who were to go into the country of the sultan taking with them such articles the products of the country of the mongols as they might hope to find a market for there there were four principal merchants but they were attended by a great number of assistants servants camel drivers etc so that the whole company formed quite a large caravan genghis khan sent with them three ambassadors who were to present to the sultan renewed assurances of the friendly feelings which he entertained for him and of his desire to encourage and promote as much as possible the commercial intercourse between the two countries which had been so happily begun the three ambassadors whom genghis khan selected for this service were themselves mohammedans he had several persons of this faith among the officers of his court although the mongols had a national religion of their own which was very different from that of the mohammedans still all forms of worship were tolerated in genghis khan's dominions and the emperor was accustomed to take good officers into his service wherever he could find them without paying any regard to the nature of their religious belief so far as their general duties were concerned but now in sending this deputation to the sultan he selected the ambassadors from among the mohammedans of his court thinking that it would please the sultan better to receive his message through persons of his own religious faith besides the three persons whom he appointed were natives of turkestan and they were of course well acquainted with the language of the country and with the country itself besides the merchants and the ambassadors genghis khan gave permission to each of his wives and also to each of the great lords of his court to send a servant or messenger with the caravan to select and purchase for their masters and mistresses whatever they might find most curious or useful in the mohammedan cities which the caravan might visit the lords and ladies were all very glad to avail themselves of the opportunity thus afforded them all these persons the ambassadors and their suite the merchants and their servants and the special messengers sent by the lords and ladies of the court formed as may well be supposed a very numerous company it is said that the caravan when ready to commence its march contained no less than four hundred and fifty persons everything being at last made ready the caravan set out on its long journey it was accompanied by a suitable escort and in order to provide still more effectually for the safety of the rich merchandise and the valuable lives committed to it genghis khan sent on orders beforehand to all the military stations on the way directing the captains to double the guard on their respective sections of the road while the caravan was passing by means of these and other similar precautions the expedition accomplished the journey in safety and arrived without any misfortune in the mohammedan country very serious misfortunes however awaited them there immediately after their arrival arising out of a train of events which had been for some time in progress and which i must now go back a little to describe it seems that some difference had arisen some time before this between the sultan mohammed and the caliph of baghdad who was the great head of the mohammedan power 
mohammed applied to the caliph to grant him certain privileges and powers which had occasionally been bestowed on other sultans who had rendered great services to the mohammedan empire he claimed that he had merited these rewards by the services which he had rendered he had conquered he said more than one hundred princes and chieftains and had cut off their heads and annexed their territories to his dominions thus greatly enlarging and extending the mohammedan power mohammed made this demand of the caliph through the medium of an ambassador whom he sent to baghdad the caliph after hearing what the ambassador had to say refused to comply he said that the services which mohammed had rendered were not of sufficient importance and value to merit the honors and privileges which mohammed demanded but although he thus declined complying with mohammed's request he showed a disposition to treat the sultan himself with all proper deference by sending an ambassador of his own to accompany mohammed's ambassador on his return with instructions to communicate the reply which the caliph felt bound to make in a respectful and courteous manner mohammed received the caliph's ambassador very honorably and in his presence concealed the anger which the answer of the caliph excited in his mind as soon as the ambassador was gone however he convened a grand council of all the great chieftains and generals and ministers of state in his dominions and announced to them his determination to raise an army and march to baghdad with a view of deposing the caliph and reigning in his stead the great personages assembled at the council were very ready to enter into this scheme for they knew that if it was successful there would be a great many honors and a great deal of booty that would fall to their share in the final distribution of the spoil so they all engaged with great zeal in aiding the sultan to form and equip his army in due time the expedition was ready and the sultan commenced his march but as often happens in such cases the preparations had been hindered by various causes of delay and it was too late in the season when the army began to move the forces moved slowly too after they commenced their march so that the winter came on while they were among the passes of the mountains the winter was unusually severe and the troops suffered so much from the frosts and the rains and from the various hardships to which they were in consequence exposed that the sultan found it impossible to go on he was consequently obliged to return and begin his work over again and the worst of it was that the caliph was now aware of his designs and would be able he knew before the next season to take effectual measures to defend himself when the caliph heard of the misfortunes which had befallen the sultan's army and his narrow escape from the dangers of a formidable invasion he was at first overjoyed and he resolved at once on making war upon the rebellious sultan in forming his plans for the campaign the idea occurred to him of endeavoring to incite genghis khan to invade the sultan's dominions from the east while he himself attacked him from the west for baghdad the capital of the caliph was to the westward of the sultan's country as the empire of the mongols was to the eastward of it but when the caliph proposed his plan to his counsellors some of them objected to it very strenuously the sultan and the people of his country were like the caliph himself mohammedans while the mongols were of another religion altogether or as the mohammedans called them unbelievers or infidels and the counsellors who objected to the caliph's proposal said that it would be very wrong to bring the enemies of god into the country of the faithful to guard against a present and temporary danger and thereby perhaps in the end occasion the ruin both of their religion and their empire it would be an impious deed they thought thus to bring in a horde of barbarian infidels to wage war with them against their brethren to this the caliph replied that the emergency was so critical that they were justified in availing themselves of any means that offered to save themselves from the ruin with which they were threatened and as to the possibility that genghis khan if admitted to the country as their ally would in the end turn his armies against them he said that they must watch 
and take measures to guard against such a danger besides he would rather have an open unbeliever like genghis khan for a foe than a mohammedan traitor and rebel like the sultan he added moreover that he did not believe that the mongol emperor felt any animosity or ill-will against the mohammedans or against their faith it was evident indeed that he did not for he had a great many mohammedans in his dominions and he allowed them to live there without molestation he even had mohammedan officers of very high rank in his court so it was finally decided to send a message and invite him to join the caliph in making war on the sultan the difficulty was now to contrive some means by which this message could be conveyed through the sultan's territories which of course lay between the dominions of the caliph and those of genghis khan to accomplish this purpose the caliph resorted to a very singular device instead of writing his communication in a letter he caused it to be pricked with a needle and some indigo by a sort of tattooing process upon the messenger's head in such a manner that it was concealed by his hair the messenger was then disguised as a countryman and sent forth he succeeded in accomplishing the journey in safety and when he arrived genghis khan had only to cause his head to be shaved when the inscription containing the caliph's proposal to him at once became legible this method of making the communication was considered very safe for even if from any accident the man had been intercepted on the way on suspicion of being a messenger the sultan's men would have found nothing in searching him to confirm their suspicions for it is not at all probable that they would have thought of looking for a letter among his hair genghis khan was well pleased to receive the proposals of the caliph but he sent back word in reply that he could not at present engage in any hostile movement against the sultan on account of the treaty of peace and commerce which he had recently established with him so long as the sultan observed the stipulations of the treaty he felt bound in honor he said not to break it he knew however he added that the restless spirit of the sultan would not long allow things to remain in the posture they were then in and that on the first occasion given he would not fail to declare war against him things were in this state when the grand caravan of merchants and ambassadors which genghis khan had sent arrived at the frontiers of the sultan's dominions after passing the frontier the first important place which they reached was a city called otrar they were received very courteously by the governor of this place and were much pleased with the opportunity afforded them to rest from the fatigues of their long journey it seems however after all that the governor's friendship for his guests was only pretended for he immediately wrote to the sultan informing him that a party of persons had arrived at his city from the mongol country who pretended to be merchants and ambassadors but that he believed that they were spies for they were extremely inquisitive about the strength of the garrisons and the state of the defences of the country generally he had no doubt he added that they were emissaries sent by genghis khan to find out the best way of invading his dominions one account states that the motive which induced the governor to make these representations to the sultan was some offence which he took at the familiar manner in which he was addressed by one of the ambassadors who was a native of otrar and had known the governor in former times when he was a private person another says that his object was to have the expedition broken up in order that he might seize for himself the rich merchandise and the valuable presents which the merchants and ambassadors had in their possession at any rate he wrote to the sultan denouncing the whole party as foreign emissaries and spies and in a short time he received a reply from the sultan directing him to put them all to death or otherwise to deal with them as he thought proper so he invited the whole party to a grand entertainment in his palace and then at a given signal probably after most of them had become in some measure helpless from the influence of the wine a body of his guards rushed in and massacred them all or rather they attempted to massacre them all but one of the merchant's men contrived in the confusion to make his escape 
he succeeded in getting back into the mongol country where he reported what had happened to genghis khan genghis khan was greatly exasperated when he heard these tidings he immediately called together his sons and all the great lords and chieftains of his court and recited to them the story of the massacre of the merchants in such a manner as to fill their hearts with indignation and rage and to inspire them all with a burning thirst for revenge he also immediately sent word to the sultan that since by so infamous an action he had violated all the engagements which had subsisted between them he from that instant declared himself his mortal enemy and would take vengeance upon him for his treacherousness and cruelty by ravaging his country with fire and sword this message was sent it was said by three ambassadors whose persons ought to have been considered sacred according to every principle of international law but the sultan as soon as they had delivered their message ordered their heads to be cut off this new massacre excited the rage and fury of genghis khan to a higher pitch than ever for three days it is said he neither ate nor slept and seemed almost beside himself with mingled vexation grief and anger and afterward he busied himself night and day with the arrangements for assembling his army and preparing to march and he allowed himself no rest until everything was ready End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion Gines, salt lake city utah the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter 18 the war with the sultan 1217 to 1218 genghis khan made his preparations for a war on an immense scale he sent messengers in every direction to all the princes khans governors and other chieftains throughout his empire with letters explaining to them the cause of the war and ordering them to repair to the places of rendezvous which he appointed with all the troops that they could raise he gave particular directions in respect to the manner in which the men were to be armed and equipped the arms required were the sabre the bow with a quiver full of arrows and the battle-axe each soldier was to also carry a rope ropes and cordage being continually in demand among people living on horseback and in tents the officers were to wear armor as well as to carry arms those who could afford it were to provide themselves with a complete coat of mail the rest were to wear helmets and breastplates only the horses were also to be protected as far as possible by breastplates either of iron or of leather thick and tough enough to prevent an arrow from penetrating when the troops thus called for appeared at the place of rendezvous appointed for them genghis khan found as is said that he had an army of seven hundred thousand men the army being thus assembled genghis khan caused certain rules and regulations or articles of war as they might be called to be drawn up and promulgated to the troops one of the rules was that no body of troops were ever to retreat without first fighting whatever the imminence of the danger might be he also ordered that where a body of men were engaged if any subordinate division of them as one company in a regiment or one regiment in a battalion should break ranks and fly before the order for a retreat should have been given by the proper authority the rest were to leave fighting the enemy and attack the portion flying and kill them all upon the spot the emperor also made formal provision for the event of his dying in the course of the campaign in this case a grand assembly of all the khans and chieftains of the empire was to be convened and then in the presence of these khans and of his sons the constitution and laws of the empire as he had established them were to be read and after the reading the assembly were to proceed to the election of a new khan according to the forms which the constitution had provided after all these affairs had been arranged genghis khan put his army in motion 
he was obliged of course to separate it into several grand divisions and to send the several divisions forward by different roads and through different sections of the country so large a body can never be kept together on a long march on account of the immense quantity of food that is required both for the horses and the men and which must be supplied in the main by the country itself which they traverse since neither horses nor men can carry food with them for more than a very few days genghis khan put one of the largest divisions under the command of his son Jughi, the prince who distinguished himself so much in the conflicts by which his father raised himself to the supreme power Jughi was ordered to advance with his division through turkestan the country where the prince kushluk had sought refuge and which still remained in some degree disaffected toward genghis khan genghis khan himself with the main body of the army took a more southerly route directly toward the dominions of the sultan in the meantime the sultan himself had not been idle he collected together all the forces that he could command when they were mustered the number of men was found to be four hundred thousand this was a large army though much smaller than that of genghis khan the sultan set out upon his march with his troops to meet the invaders after advancing for some distance he learned that the army of Jughi, which had passed through turkestan was at the northward of his position and he found that by turning in that direction he might hope to meet and conquer that part of the mongol force before it could have time to join the main body he determined at once to adopt this plan he accordingly turned his course and marched forward into the part of the country where he supposed Jughi to be at length he came to a place where his scouts found near a river a great many dead bodies lying on the ground among the others who had fallen there was one man who was wounded but was not dead this wounded man told the scouts that the bodies were those of persons who had been slain by the army of Jughi, which had just passed that way the sultan accordingly pressed forward and soon overtook them Jughi was hastening on in order to join his father Jughi consulted his generals in respect to what it was best to do they advised him to avoid a battle we are not strong enough said they to encounter alone the whole of the sultan's army it is better that we should retreat which we can do in an orderly manner and thus join the main body before we give the enemy battle or if the sultan should attempt to pursue us he cannot keep his army together in doing so they will necessarily become divided into detachments on the road and then we can turn and destroy them in detail which will be a much surer mode of proceeding than for us to attack them in the mass Jughi was not willing to follow this advice what will my father and my brothers think said he when they see us coming to them flying from the enemy without having fought them contrary to his express commands no we must stand our ground trusting to our valor and do our best if we are to die at all we had better be slain in battle than in flight you have done your duty in admonishing me of the danger we are in and now it remains for me to do mine in trying to bring you out of it with honor so he ordered the army to halt and to be drawn up in order of battle the battle was soon commenced and it was continued throughout the day the mongols though fewer in numbers were superior to their enemies in discipline and in courage and the advantage was obviously on their side though they did not gain a decisive victory toward night however the sultan's troops evinced everywhere a disposition to give way and it was with great difficulty that the officers could induce them to maintain their ground until the darkness came on and put an end to the conflict when at length the combatants could no longer see to distinguish friend from foe the two armies withdrew to their respective camps and built their fires for the night Jughi thought that by fighting during this day he had done all that his father required of him to vindicate the honor of the army and that now it would be most prudent to retreat without risking another battle on the morrow so he caused fresh supplies of fuel 
to be put upon the campfires in order to deceive the enemy and then marched out of his camp in the night with all his men the next morning by the time that the sultan's troops were again under arms he had advanced far on his march to join his father and was beyond their reach he soon rejoined his father and was received by him with great joy genghis khan was extremely pleased with the course which his son had pursued and bestowed upon him many public honors and rewards after this other great battles were fought between the two armies at one of them a great trumpet fifteen feet long is mentioned among the other martial instruments that were used to excite the men to ardor in making the charge in these battles the mongols were victorious the sultan however still continued to make head as well as he could against the invaders until at length he found that he had lost one hundred and sixty thousand of his men this was almost half of his army and the loss enfeebled him so much that he was convinced that it was useless for him any longer to resist the mongols in the open field so he sent off his army in detachments to the different towns and fortresses of his kingdom ordering the several divisions to shut themselves up and defend themselves as well as they could in the places assigned to them until better times should return the sultan however did not seek shelter in this way for himself he selected from his troop a certain portion of those who were most active and alert and were best mounted and formed of them a sort of flying squadron with which he could move rapidly from place to place through the country wherever his aid might be most required genghis khan of course now prepared to attack the cities where the several divisions of the sultan's army had entrenched themselves he wished first to get possession of otrar which was the place where the ambassadors and the merchants had been massacred but the city was not very large and so instead of marching toward it himself he gave the charge of capturing it to two of his younger sons whom he sent off for the purpose at the head of a suitable detachment he himself with the main body set off upon a march toward the cities of samarkand and bokhara which were the great central cities of the sultan's dominions End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the history of genghis khan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the history of genghis khan by jacob abbott chapter nineteen the fall of bokhara twelve hundred seventeen to twelve hundred nineteen bokhara was a great and beautiful city it was situated in the midst of a very fine and fertile country in a position very favorable for the trade and commerce of those days it was also a great seat of learning and of the arts and sciences it contained many institutions in which were taught such arts and sciences as were then cultivated and students resorted to it from all the portions of western asia the city proper was enclosed with a strong wall besides this there was an outer wall thirty miles in circumference which enclosed the suburbs of the town and also a beautiful region of parks and gardens which contained the public places of amusement and the villas of the wealthy inhabitants it was this peaceful seat of industry and wealth that genghis khan with his hordes of ruthless barbarians was coming now to sack and plunder the first city which the mongols reached on their march toward bokhara was one named zarnuk in approaching it a large troop rode up toward the walls uttering terrific shouts and outcries the people shut the gates in great terror genghis khan however sent an officer to them to say that it was useless for them to attempt to resist him and to advise them to surrender at once they must demolish their citadel he said and send out all the young and able-bodied men to genghis khan the officer advised them too 
to send out presents to Genghis Khan as an additional means of propitiating him and inducing him to spare the town. The inhabitants yielded to this advice. The gates were thrown open. All the young men, who were capable of bearing arms, were marshaled and marched out to the Mongol camp. They were accompanied by the older men among the inhabitants, who took with them the best that the town contained for presents. Genghis Khan accepted the presents, ordered the young men to be enrolled in his army, and then, dismissing the older ones in peace, he resumed his march and went on his way. He next came to a town named Nur. One of the men from Zarnuk served as a guide to show the detachment which was sent to summon the city a near way to reach it. Nur was a sort of sacred town, having many holy places in it, which were resorted to by many pilgrims and other devotees. The people of Nur shut the gates, and for some time refused to surrender, but at last, finding that it was useless to attempt to resist, they opened the gates and allowed the Mongols to come in. Genghis Khan, to punish the inhabitants, as he said, for even thinking of resisting him, set aside a supply of cattle and other provisions to keep them from starving, and then gave up all the rest of the property found in the town to be divided among his soldiers as plunder. At length the army reached the great plain in which Bokhara was situated and encamped before the town. Bokhara was very large and very populous, as may well be supposed from its outer wall of thirty miles in circuit, and Genghis Khan did not expect to make himself master of it without considerable difficulty and delay. He was, however, very intent on besieging and taking it, not only on account of the general wealth and importance of the place, but also because he supposed that the sultan himself was at this time within the walls. He had heard that the sultan had retreated there with his flying squadron, taking with him all his treasure. This was, however, a mistake. The sultan was not there. He had gone there, it is true, at first, and had taken with him the most valuable of his treasures, but before Genghis Khan arrived, he had secretly withdrawn to Samarkand, thinking that he might be safer there. In truth, the sultan was beginning to be very much disheartened and discouraged. Among other things which occurred to disturb his mind, certain letters were found and brought to him, as if they had been intercepted, which letters gave accounts of a conspiracy among his officers to desert him and go over to the side of Genghis Khan. These letters were not signed, and the sultan could not discover who had written them, but the pretended conspiracy which they revealed filled his soul with anxiety and distress. It was only a pretended conspiracy, after all, for the letters were written by a man in Genghis Khan's camp, and with Genghis Khan's permission or connivance. This man was a Mohammedan and had been in the sultan's service, but the sultan had put to death his father and his brothers on account of some alleged offense, and he had become so incensed at the act that he had deserted to Genghis Khan, and now he was determined to do his former sovereign all the mischief in his power. His intimate knowledge of persons and things connected with the sultan's court and army enabled him to write these letters in such a way as to deceive the sultan completely. It was past midsummer when the army of Genghis Khan laid siege to Bokhara, and it was not until the spring of the following year that they succeeded in carrying the outer wall, so strongly was the city fortified and so well was it defended. After having forced the outer wall, the Mongols destroyed the suburbs of the town, devastating the cultivated gardens and grounds, and pillaged the villas. They then took up their position around the inner wall and commenced the siege of the city itself in due form. The sultan had left three of his greatest generals in command of the town. These men determined not to wait the operations of Genghis Khan in attacking the walls, 
but to make a sudden sally from the gates with the whole force that could be spared and attack the besiegers in their entrenchments they made this sally in the night at a time when the mongols were least expecting it they were however wholly unsuccessful they were driven back into the city with great loss the generals it seems had determined to risk all on this desperate attempt and in case it failed at once to abandon the city to its fate accordingly when driven into the city through the gates on one side they marched directly through it and passed out through the gates on the other side hoping to save themselves and the garrison by this retreat with a view of ultimately rejoining the sultan they however went first in a southerly direction from the city toward the river amor the generals took their families and those of the principal officers of the garrison with them the night was dark and they succeeded in leaving the city without being observed in the morning however all was discovered and genghis khan sent off a strong detachment of well-mounted troops in pursuit these troops after about a day's chase overtook the flying garrison near the river there was no escape for the poor fugitives and the merciless mongols destroyed them almost every one by riding over them trampling them down with their horses hoofs and cutting them to pieces with their sabres in the meantime while this detachment had been pursuing the garrison genghis khan knowing that there were no longer any troops within the city to defend it and that everything there was in utter confusion determined on a grand final assault but while his men were getting the engines ready to batter down the walls a procession consisting of all the magistrates and clergy and a great mass of the principal citizens came forth from one of the gates bearing with them the keys of the city these keys they offered to genghis khan in token of surrender and begged him to spare their lives the emperor received the keys and said to the citizens that he would spare their lives on condition that if there were any of the sultan's soldiers concealed in the city they would give them up and that they would also seize and deliver to him any of the citizens that were suspected of being in the sultan's interest this they took a solemn oath that they would do the soldiers however that is those that remained in the town were not delivered up most of them retired to the castle which was a sort of citadel and put themselves under the command of the governor of the castle who being a very energetic and resolute man declared that he would never surrender there were a great many of the young men of the town sons of the leading citizens who also retired to the castle determined not to yield to the conqueror genghis khan having thus obtained the keys of the city itself caused the gates to be opened and his troops marched in and took possession he had promised the citizens that his soldiers should spare the lives of the people and should not pillage the houses on condition that the magistrates delivered up peaceably the public magazines of grain and other food to supply his army also that all the people who had buried or otherwise concealed gold and silver or other treasures should bring them forth again and give them up or else make known where they were concealed this the people promised that they would do after having entered the town genghis khan was riding about the streets on horseback at the head of his troop of guards when he came to a large and very beautiful edifice the doors were wide and he drove his horse directly in his troops and the other soldiers who were there followed him in there were also with him some of the magistrates of the town who were accompanying him in his progress about the city after the whole party had entered the edifice genghis khan looked around and then asked them in a jeering manner if that was the sultan's palace no they said it is the house of god the building was a mosque on hearing this genghis khan alighted from his horse and giving the bridle to one of the principal magistrates to hold he went up in a very irreverent manner to a sacred place where the priests were accustomed to sit 
he seized the copy of the Koran which he found there and threw it down under the feet of the horses. After amusing himself for a time in desecrating the temple by these and other similar performances, he caused his soldiers to bring in their provisions and allowed them to eat and drink in the temple in a riotous manner without any regard to the sacredness of the place or to the feelings of the people of the town which he outraged by this conduct a few days after this genghis khan assembled all the magistrates and principal citizens of the town and made a speech to them from an elevated stand or pulpit which was erected for the purpose he began his speech by praising god and claiming to be an object of his special favor in proof of which he recounted the victories which he had obtained as he said through the divine aid he then went on to denounce the perfidious conduct of the sultan toward him in making a solemn treaty of peace with him and then treacherously murdering his merchants and ambassadors he said that the sultan was a detestable tyrant and that god had commissioned him to rid the earth of all such monsters he said in conclusion that he would protect their lives and would not allow his soldiers to take away their household goods provided they surrendered to him fairly and honestly all their money and other treasures and if any of them refused to do this or to tell where their treasures were hid he would put them to torture and compel them to tell the wretched inhabitants of the town feeling that they were entirely at the mercy of the terrible hordes that were in possession of the city did not attempt to conceal anything they brought forward their hidden treasures and even offered their household goods to the conqueror if he was disposed to take them they were only anxious to save if possible their dwellings and their lives genghis khan appeared at first to be pleased with the submissive spirit which they manifested but at last under pretense that he heard of some soldiers being concealed somewhere and perhaps irritated at the citadels holding out so long against him he ordered the town to be set on fire the buildings were almost all of wood and the fire raged among them with great fury multitudes of the inhabitants perished in the flames and great numbers died miserably afterward from want and exposure the citadel immediately afterward surrendered and it would seem that genghis khan began to feel satisfied with the amount of misery which he had caused for it is said that he spared the lives of the governor and of the soldiers although we might have expected that he would have massacred them all the citadel was however demolished and thus the town itself and all that pertained to it became a mass of smoking ruins the property pillaged from the inhabitants was divided among the mongol troops while the people themselves went away to roam as vagabonds and beggars over the surrounding country and to die of want and despair what difference is there between such a conqueror as this and the captain of a band of pirates or of robbers except in the immense magnitude of the scale on which he perpetrates his crimes the satisfaction which genghis khan felt at the capture of bokhara was greatly increased by the intelligence which he received soon afterward from the two princes whom he had sent to lay siege to otrar informing him that the city had fallen into their hands and that the governor of it the officer who had so treacherously put to death the ambassadors and the merchants had been taken and slain the name of this governor was geir khan the sultan knowing that genghis khan would doubtless make this city one of his first objects of attack left the governor a force of fifty thousand men to defend it he afterwards sent him an additional force of ten thousand men under the command of a general named Karyakis. with these soldiers the governor shut himself up in the city he knew very well that if he surrendered or was taken he could expect no mercy and he went to work accordingly strengthening the fortifications and laying in stores of provisions determined to fight to the last extremity the captain of the guard who came to assist him had not the same reason 
for being so very obstinate in the defense of the town, and this difference in the situation of the two commanders led to difficulty in the end, as we shall presently see. The Mongol princes began the siege of Otrar by filling up the ditches that encircled the outer wall of the town in the places where they wished to plant their battering rams to make breaches in the walls. They were hindered a great deal in their work, as is usual in such cases, by the sallies of the besieged, who rushed upon them in the night, in great numbers, and with such desperate fury, that they often succeeded in destroying some of the engines, or setting them on fire, before they could be driven back into the town. This continued for some time, until at last the Mongol princes began to be discouraged, and they sent word to their father, who was then engaged in the siege of Bokhara, informing him of the desperate defense which was made by the garrison of Otrar, and asking his permission to turn the siege into a blockade, that is, to withdraw from the immediate vicinity of the walls, and to content themselves with investing the city closely on every side, so as to prevent any one from going out or coming in, until the provisions of the town should be exhausted, and the garrison be starved into a surrender. In this way, they said, the lives of vast numbers of the troops would be saved. But their father sent back word to them that they must do no such thing, but must go on and fight their way into the town, no matter how many of the men were killed. So the princes began again with fresh ardor, and they pushed forward their operations with such desperate energy that in less than a month the outer wall and the works of the besieged to defend it were all in ruins. The towers were beaten down, the ramparts were broken, and many breaches were made through which the besiegers might be expected at any moment to force their way into the town. The besieged were accordingly obliged to abandon the outer walls and retire within the inner lines. The Mongols now had possession of the suburbs, and after pillaging them of all that they could convert to their own use, and burning and destroying everything else, they advanced to attack the inner works, and here the contest between the besiegers and the garrison was renewed more fiercely than ever. The besieged continued their resistance for five months, defending themselves by every possible means from the walls, and making desperate sallies from time to time in order to destroy the Mongols' engines and kill the men. At length, Cariacus, the captain of the guard, who had been sent to assist the governor in defense of the town, began to think it was time that the carnage should cease and that the town should be surrendered. But the governor, who knew that he would most assuredly be beheaded if in any way he fell into the hands of the enemy, would not listen to any proposal of the kind. He succeeded also in exciting among the people of the town and among the soldiers of the garrison such a hatred of the Mongols, whom he represented as infidels of the very worst character, the enemies alike of God and man, that they joined him in the determination not to surrender. Cariacus now found himself an object of suspicion and distrust in the town and in the garrison on account of his having made the proposal to surrender, and feeling that he was not safe, he determined to make a separate peace for himself and his ten thousand by going out secretly in the night and giving himself up to the princes. He thought that by doing this and by putting the Mongols in possession of the gate, through which his troops were to march out, so as to enable them to gain admission to the city, his life would be spared, and that he might perhaps be admitted into the service of Genghis Khan. But he was mistaken in this idea. The princess said that a man who would betray his own countrymen would betray them if he ever had a good opportunity. So they ordered him and all his officers to be slain, and the men to be divided among the soldiers as slaves. They nevertheless took possession of the gate by which the deserters had come out, and by this means gained admission to the city. The governor fled to the citadel with all the men whom he could assemble, and shut himself up in it. 
Here he fought desperately for a month, making continual sallies at the head of his men, and doing everything that the most resolute and reckless bravery could do to harass and beat off the besiegers. But all was in vain. In the end, the walls of the citadel were so broken down by the engines brought to bear upon them that one day the Mongols, by a determined and desperate assault, made on all sides simultaneously, forced their way in through the most dreadful scenes of carnage and destruction, and began killing without mercy every soldier that they could find. The soldiers defended themselves to the last. Some took refuge in narrow courts and lanes, and on the roofs of the houses, for the citadel was so large that it formed of itself quite a little town, and fought desperately till they were brought down by the arrows of the Mongols. The governor took his position, in company with two men who were with him, on a terrace of his palace, and refused to surrender, but fought on furiously, determined to kill any one who attempted to come near him. His wife was near, doing all in her power to encourage and sustain him. Genghis Khan had given orders to the princes not to kill the governor, but to take him alive. He wished to have the satisfaction of disposing of him himself. For this reason, the soldiers who attempted to take him on the terrace were very careful not to shoot their arrows at him, but only at the men who were with him, and while they did so a great many of them were killed by the arrows which the governor and his two friends discharged at those who attempted to climb up to the place where they were standing. After a while the two men were killed, but the governor remained alive, yet nobody could come near him. Those that attempted it were shot and fell back again among their companions below. The governor's wife supplied him with arrows as fast as he could use them. At length all the arrows were spent, and then she brought him stones, which he hurled down upon his assailants when they tried to climb up to him. But at last so many ascended together that the governor could not beat them all back, and he was at length surrounded and secured, and immediately put in irons. The princes wrote word at once to their father that the town was taken, and that the governor was in their hands a prisoner. They received orders to return to bring him with them to Bokhara. While on the way, however, another order came requiring them to put the prisoner to death, and this order was immediately executed. What was the fate of his courageous and devoted wife has never been known. End of chapter 19